Ahang Brante Ti Serenena Saha Pancha Sila Ni Yachami Duti Ampia Hang Brante Ti Serenena Saha Pancha Sila Ni Yachami Tati Ampia Hang Brante Ti Serenena Saha Pancha Sila Ni Yachami Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 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 Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranang kacahan. Buddhang saranang kacahami. Dhammang saranang kacahami. Dhammang saranang kacahami. Sanghang saranang kacahami. Sanghang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi budang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi budang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi dhammang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi dhammang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi sanghang saranang kacahami. Duti ampi sanghang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi budang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi budang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi damang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi damang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi sanggang saranang kacahami. Tati ampi sanggang saranang kacahami. Ti saranagamanang vititang Ama bante Pana tipata vedamani sikaha padang samadhiya Pana tipata vedamani sikaha padang samadhiya mi Adinna dana vedamani sikaha padang samadhiya Adinna dana vermani sikha padang samadhi ami. Ami su mitha dara vermani sikha padang samadhi ami. Ami su mitha dara vermani sikha padang samadhi ami. Musavada Vedamani Sikaha Padang Samadhyam Musavada Vedamani Sikaha Padang Samadhyam Sura Miraya Majapamada Thana Vedamani Sikaha Padang Samadhyam Sura Miraya Majapamada Thana Vermani Sikha Padang Samadhi Ami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukating Yanti Silena Bahoka Sampada Silena Nibuting Yanti Tasma Silam Sodhaji Sadu 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 Under twelve, Mahasunyata Sutta, the great discourse on voidness. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Sakyan country at Kapil, but to in Nigrora's park. Then when it was morning, the Blessed One, and taking his ball and outer robe, went into Kapilvatu for arms when he had wandered for arms in Kapilvatu and had returned from 
his arms round after his meal he went for his daytime abiding to the dwelling of Kala Ke Maka the Sakyan. Now on that occasion there were many resting places prepared in Kala Kemaka the Sakyan's dwelling. When the Blessed One saw this, he thought there are many resting places prepared in Kala Kema and the Sakyan's dwelling. Do many bhikkhus live there? Now on that occasion, the Venerable Ananda, along with many bhikkhus, was busy making robes at Kat. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from treat, retreat and went to Kata, the Sakyan's dwelling. There he sat down on a seat made ready and asked the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, there are many resting places prepared in Kala Kemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Do many vikus live there? Venerable sir, many resting places have been prepared in Kala Kemaka, the Sakyan's dwelling. Many vikus are living there. This is our time for making rows, Venerable sir. Nanda, a bhikkhu does not shine by delighting in company, by taking delight in company, by devoting himself to delight in company, by delighting in society, by taking delight in society, by rejoicing in society. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a bhikkhu who delights in company takes delight in company and devotes himself to delight in company, who delights in society, takes delight in society, and rejoices in society, will ever obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. But it can be expected that when a bhikkhu lives alone, withdrawn from society, he will obtain at will, without trouble or difficulty, the bliss of renunciation, the bliss of seclusion, the bliss of peace, the bliss of enlightenment. Indeed, Ananda, it is not possible that a bhikkhu who delights in company takes delight in company and devotes himself to delight in company, who delight in society, takes delight in society and rejoice in society, will ever enter upon and abide in either the deliverance of the mind that is temporary and delectable or in the deliverance of the mind that is perpetual and unshakable. But it can be expected that when a bhikkhu lives alone, withdraw from society, he will enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind that is temporary and delectable or in the deliverance of the mind that is perpetual and unshakable. I do not see even a single kind of form, Ananda, from the change and alteration of which there would not arise sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair in one who lusts for it and takes delight in it. However, Ananda, there is this abiding discovered by the Tathagata, to enter and abide in voidness, internally by giving no attention to all signs. If, while the Tathagata is abiding thus, he, visited, he is visited by bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, by men or women, lay followers, by kings or king's ministers, by other secretarians or their, their disciples, and with a mind leaning to seclusion, tending and inclining to seclusion, withdrawn, delighting in renunciation, and altogether done away with things that are the basis for taints, he invariably talks to them in a way concerned with dismissing them. I had a question up, uh, from the fourth uh, paragraph. I just wish to understand what um, 
the difference, I guess, is with uh, deliverance of mind that is temporary and delectable or uh, is perpetual and unshakable. Well, there's a note. But we didn't read it. (laughs) Yeah, we can read the notes too, I think. I, I just read it. Yeah, it refers to the jhanas. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Seven. Therefore, Ananda, if a bhikkhu should wish, may I enter upon and abide in voidness internally. He should steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate it. And how does he steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness? and concentrated here Ananda, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a bhikkhu enters upon and abides in the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. That is how a bhikkhu steadies his mind internally, quiets it, brings it to singleness, and concentrates it. Then he gives attention to voidness internally. Uh, MA explains voidness internally as the connected with, uh, as that connected with one's own five aggregates. Voidness externally as that connected with the aggregates of others. The voidness spoken of here thus must be the temporary deliverance of mind reached through the insight contemplation of non-self as explained in the uh, 4333. When the insight into non-self is brought to the level of the path, it issues in the fruition experiencing Nibbana by way of its aspect of voidness. While he is giving attention to voidness internally, his mind does not enter into voidness internally or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. When that is so, he understands thus, while I'm giving attention to voidness internally, my mind does not enter into voidness internally or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. He gives attention to voidness externally. He gives attention to voidness internally and externally. He gives attention to imperturbability. He gives attention to an imperturbable immaterial meditative attainment. While he is giving attention to imperturbability, his mind does not enter into imperturbability or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. When that is so, he understands thus. While I'm giving attention to imperturbability, my mind does not enter into imperturbability or acquire confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Pante, is this uh, giving attention uh, sati? Uh, it's manasik, manasikara, manasikara, I guess. Yeah. Bante, sorry, I have a question. I don't uh, uh, actually understand uh, this uh, sentence. While I'm, I'm giving attention to voidness internally, my mind does not enter into voidness internally. I don't understand that. Why is that? Why the mind cannot enter in that state if he's aware of it? Well, you can't control the mind, so this is a this is a part of the practice of mindfulness. It's this um, self awareness, realizing the state of the mind, understanding the state of the mind. In the next paragraph, it talks about bringing the mind 
steadying, steadying the mind, quieting the mind, bringing it to singleness. Mm. It's uh, non-self. Just because you see it doesn't mean it's the way you want it. But as a result of seeing it, there is change. You start to incline towards singleness to quietude. And I mean, it's why we practice meditation, because the changes occur as a result of the inclination, as a result of the repetition. Uh, thank you, Bante. Um, I just want to say something, you know, like, because when I meditate and I see that, for example, there is confusion and then I understand it. And, uh, you know, like I move on because the, actually then after there is something else. So then I understand that, that uh, okay, that there is confusion and uh, I cannot control it. So for that reason, I ask that question. Because uh, in that moment, uh, my mind is, uh, there is an understanding, no, that, uh, that this is uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even that understanding helps to weaken that sort of understanding in general helps to weaken things like confusion because you have a better grasp of reality. So for confusion, for example, you're less confused because you're you're more clear-minded, you're more in tune with truth, knowledge, with which, is, which is the opposite of confusion. You don't, you're not confused when you have knowledge, doubt as well. And of course, the others like worry, you wouldn't be worried when you understand that, when you understand things as they are, because reality is no reason to be worried about fear, anger, liking and disliking. None of those things fit with reality, so the familiarity dispels them all. That's why ignorance is considered to be the root because all it takes is an is understanding, and it's not intellectual like knowledge. It's just familiarity and observation and direct, direct knowing, knowing through experience, through seeing. Which is why we call it vipassana, seeing clearly. Thank you, Bhante. Then that bhikkhu should steady his mind internally, quiet it, bring it to singleness and concentrate it on that same sign of concentration as before. And note 1154 reads, MA, this refers to the jhana that was used as the basis for insight. If, after emerging from the basic jhana, his mind does not enter into voidness through insight contemplation on its own aggregates or those of others, and he also cannot attain the imperturbable imperial attainment, he should return to the same basic jhana that he originally developed and attend to it again and again. Then he gives attention to voidness internally. While he is giving attention to voidness internally, his mind enters into voidness internally and acquires confidence, steadiness and decision. When that is so, he understands that while I am giving attention to voidness internally, my mind enters into voidness internally and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. He gives attention to voidness externally. He gives attention to voidness internally and externally. He gives attention to imperturbability while he is giving attention to Imperturbability, his mind enters into imperturbability and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. When that is so, he understands that while I am giving attention to imperturbability, my mind enters into imperturbability and acquires confidence, steadiness, and decision. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Uh, when a bhikkhu abides thus, if his mind inclines to walking, he walks, thinking, while I'm walking thus, no evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief will beset me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. And when a bhikkhu abides thus, in his mind, 
if his mind decline, inclines to standing, he stands. If his mind inclines to sitting, he sits. If his mind inclines to lying down, he lies down, thinking, while I'm lying down thus, no evil and wholesome states will beset me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. When a bhikkhu abides thus, if his mind inclines to talking, he resolves. Such talk as is low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which does not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, talk of kings, robbers, ministers, armies, dangers, battles, food, drink, clothing, beds, garlands, perfumes, relatives, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, countries, women, heroes, streets, wells, the dead, trivialities, the origin of the world, the origin of the sea, whether things are so or are not so, such talk I shall not utter. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But he resolves, such talk as deals with effacement, as favors the mind's release, and which leads to complete disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana. That is, talk on wanting little, on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue, concentration, wisdom, deliverance, knowledge and vision of deliverance. Such talk I shall utter. In this way, he has full awareness of that. I, I have a question in regards to when he start, starts to talk about walking and all of these postures, actually, uh, he says that uh, if his mind inclines to walking, thinking, walking or sitting, so it, does this mean in um, our practice that um, so we have this urge or, or need to change our posture, actually, and then we just do it, and that's not out of wanting or craving or something, or aversion. Well, both are possible. It's possible to incline for something out of unwholesomeness. Possible to incline towards something without unwholesomeness. So we generally recommend new meditators not to give in to changing their posture at whim. And we do that by uh, instructing to use a timer. But for someone who is intensively practicing and has, uh, at the end of their meditation course, then there's a period where they can go according to the inclination because their minds are in this still abiding. So there's less risk of unwholesomeness. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you for explaining, Bantu. When a bhikkhu abides thus, if his mind inclines to thinking, he resolves. Such thoughts as are low, vulgar, coarse, ignoble, unbeneficial, and which do not lead to disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty, such thoughts I shall not think. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But he resolves. Such thoughts as are noble and emancipating and lead the one who practices in accordance with them to the complete destruction of suffering, that is, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. Such thoughts I shall think. In this way, 
He has full awareness of that. Ananda, there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. One, one, five, five. According to MA, up to this point, the Buddha has shown the training for the attainment of the first two paths, those of stream entry and ones in returning. He now speaks the present passage 14 to 15 to point out the insight needed to attain the path of non-returning, which culminates in the abandoning of sensual desire. What five forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust, sounds of cognizable by, cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. Here in a bhikkhu should constantly review his own mind thus. Does any mental excitement concerning any base among these five chords of sensual pleasure ever arise in me? If on reviewing his mind the bhikkhu understands, Mental ex excitement concerning a certain base among these five chords of sensual pressure does arise in me. Then he understands desire and lust for the five chords of sensual pressure are abandoned in me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. But if on reviewing his mind, the bhikkhu understands no mental ex excitement concern concerning any base among these five chords of sensual pressure arise in me, then he understands desire and lust for the, for the five chords of sensual pressure are abandoned in me. In this way, he has full awareness of that. Ananda, there are these five aggregates affected by clinging. 1156, the passage 16 to 17 points out the insight needed to attain the path of our hardship which culminates in the abandoning of the conceit I am. In regards to which a bhikkhu should abide contemplating rise and fall thus, such is material form, such its arising, such its disappearance, such is feeling, such its arising, such its disappearance, such is perception, such its arising, such its disappearance, such are formations, such they are arising, such their disappearance, such is consciousness, such is arising, such its disappearance. Paragraph 17. When he abides contemplating rise and fall in these five aggregates affected by clinging, the concept I am based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is abandoned in him. When that is so, the bhikkhu understands the concept I am based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is abandoned in me. In that way, he has full awareness of that. These states are entirely wholesome and have a wholesome outcome. They are noble, supramundane and inaccessible to the evil one. Paragraph 19, what do you think, Ananda? What good does a disciple see that he should seek the teacher's company even if he is told to go away? Venerable Sir, our teachings are rooted in the Blessed One, guided by the Blessed One, have the Blessed One as their resort. It would be good if the Blessed One would explain the meaning of these words. Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus will remember it. Ananda, a disciple should not seek the teacher's company for the sake of discourses, stanzas, stanzas and expositions. Why is that? For a long time, Ananda, 
You have learned the teachings, remembered them, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind and penetrated them well by view. But such talk as deals with effacement as favors the mind's release and which leads to complete disenchantment, dispassion, cessation, peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, and nibbana, that is, talk on wanting little, on contentment, seclusion, aloofness from society, arousing energy, virtue, concentration, wisdom, deliverance, knowledge, and vision of deliverance, for the sake of such talk, a disciple should seek the teacher's company, even if he is told to go away. Number 21. Since this is so, Ananda, a teacher's undoing may come about. His undoing may come about, and the undoing of one who lives the holy life may come about. 1157. Akriya Padava Antavas Antavas Suppadava Brahmacharya Padava Uppadava may also be rendered as disaster, calamity. And may explains that Buddha speaks the represent passage to show the danger in solit sol solitude when one does not fulfill the proper purpose of solitary living. The teacher is a teacher outside the Buddha's dispensation. Number 22. And how does the teacher's undoing come about? Here is some teacher resorts to a secluded re resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, the channel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. And as a result, he goes astray and becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving and reverts to luxury. This teacher is said to be undone by the teacher's undoing. He has been struck down by evil, unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. This is how the teacher's undoing comes about. And how does a pupil's undoing come about? A pupil of that teacher, emulating the teacher's seclusion, resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him, and as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving, and re reverts to luxury. This pupil is said to be undone by the pupil's undoing. He has been struck down by evil and wholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. This is how the pupil's undoing comes about. And how does the undoing of one who lives the holy life come about? Here a Tathagata appears in the world accomplished and fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of a person's to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him. Yet he does not go astray or become filled with desire, succumb to craving, and revert to luxury. But a disciple of this teacher, emulating his teacher's seclusion, resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, a heap of straw. While he lives thus withdrawn, 
Brahmins and householders from town and country visit him, and as a result, he goes astray, becomes filled with desire, succumbs to craving, and reverts to luxury. This one who lives the holy life is said to be undone by the undoing of one who lives the holy life. He has been struck down by evil, unwholesome states that defile, bring renewal of being, give trouble, ripen in suffering, and lead to future birth, aging, and death. Thus, there comes to be the undoing of one who leads the holy life. And here in Ananda, the undoing of one who leads the holy life has a more painful result, a more bitter result, than the teacher's undoing or the pupil's undoing. And it even leads to perdition. Note 1158. M.A. The going forth into homelessness outside the dispensation, dispensation brings small gain. So one who falls away from that falls away only from mundane attainment. He meets with no great suffering as one who falls from, falls from the back of a donkey merely becomes covered with dust. But the going forth in the Buddha's dispensation brings great gain. The paths, fruits, and nibbana. Thus, who falls away from this meets great suffering, like one who falls from the back of an elephant. End quote. 25. Therefore, Ananda behaved towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. How do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness? Here, Ananda, compassionate and seeking their welfare, the teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples do not want to hear or give ear or exert their minds to understand. They err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave towards the teacher with hostility, not with friendliness. And how do disciples behave towards the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility? Dear Ananda, compassionate and seeking their welfare, teacher teaches the Dhamma to the disciples out of compassion. This is for your welfare. This is for your happiness. His disciples want to hear and give ear and exert their minds to understand. They do not err and turn aside from the teacher's dispensation. Thus do disciples behave toward the teacher with friendliness, not with hostility. Therefore, Ananda, behave towards me with friendliness, not with hostility. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. I shall not treat you as the potter treats the raw, damp clay. Repeatedly restraining you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. Repeatedly admonishing you, I shall speak to you, Ananda. A sound core will stand the test. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu. 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 So there's a note uh, 1159 that says the contrast in this uh, simile is between the way the potter treats the raw damp clay and the way he treats the baked pot produced from the clay. In my paraphrases, after advising once, I shall not be silent. I shall advise and instruct by repeatedly admonishing you, just as the potter tests the big pots, puts aside those that are cracked, split, or faulty, and keeps only those that pass the test. So I shall advise and instruct uh, by repeating, repeatedly testing you. Those among you who are sound, having reached the path and fruits, will stand the test. It may add that uh, mundane virtues, what mundane virtuous qualities are also intended as criterion of soundness. Yeah, this part sounded very harsh, <laughs> repeatedly admonishing you. I shall speak to you. My goodness. Yeah, once you have a thick skin, you can take it. If you are very sensitive, it's not for you. Um, in uh, paragraph 17, uh, there it starts with, when he abides contemplating rise and fall, 
in these five aggregates affected by clinging, etc. So uh, this is not the rise and fall of the abdomen, right? It's it's the arising and ceasing of the aggregate appearing and disappearing, right? Right. Uh, Bonte, I have a question. Um, in paragraph 18, it um, refers to evil one. Is that referring to Mara? Yes. Yeah, the rising and falling is Udaya Baya. Udaya and Vaya. Yeah, I see. I mean, this is such a strong teaching. If I remember I already found that passage. Uh, Buddha says that uh, delighting in uh, society will never allow a person to... Most people are like that, like they want the crowd to feel okay. Yeah. People around them, friends around them, people to chat, hang out with them. Yeah, yeah, I, I did understand that, um, you know, deliverance can cannot come at all if you are like that. You're constantly craving uh, company. There is always students around teachers. They want to know, they want to learn what a teacher can do. Well, it's not actually talking about society. It's talking about the desire for society. The oh, love of society. Which okay. uh, involves, I mean, the thing about it is external things like that involve conceptual reality. They make you lose sight of experience. You can be amongst people and still be conscious and aware and mindful of your experiences. Even when you're talking, you can be aware of your lips moving and the thoughts in your head and when listening and when seeing people. Uh, I have a question about the uh, note 1158. Yeah, it says about uh, going forth into homelessness outside the dispensation brings small gain. So who falls away from that falls away only from mundane attainment. He meets with no great suffering. Um, so from what I understand on that, if you go into I don't understand what the going to homelessness part of it is, but if you're outside the dispensation and you say revert back to your previous life, the damage to you is less than if you going forth into Buddha's dispensation and then fall away from that, the damage is greater. So are you actually better off going into homelessness as as it says here without following Buddha's dispensation first? just in case you do have to return to your normal life or your previous life. Well, there are some cases if, if you become bitter towards the Buddhist teaching, that can be worse than being uh, averse to an inferior teaching. And what does the homelessness part of it uh, relate to? Well, I mean, it's, uh, be becoming ordained in the tradition. Ordained. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Right. It's, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not reading the commentary. I don't know if it actually uses the Agarasaminga Nagariya, Apajitwa, but that, there's a standard phrase that goes like that, going forth from home life into homelessness, but often it's just Pabajit, Pabajita or Pabaja, which technically means um, but, yeah, I don't even know if it means homelessness, but it's the right. The going forth is how it's translated. It means the committal. It's like yeah. if you follow the giants or self mortification practice, and then you later realize this is useless, and you gave that up. There's no loss for you. Compare that to uh, becoming a monk, and then committing a parajika and losing your monkhood, that is a, that is a, a much greater loss. 
Yeah, I mean, one way of looking at it is if you lose a large inheritance versus a small inheritance. Suppose you're in somewhat, you're in your parents' will, and they're very rich, and then you do something, or you you dis they disown you, or you disown them, and they take you out of their will. Well, that's a much greater loss than if your parents were poor, or that sort of thing. I mean, that's one way of looking at it. But there's also, I guess, a sense of, or potentially, a sense of the um, evil done towards Buddhism is greater. So if you have some kind of disrespect or if you get, get in a fight with the Buddha, for example, it's much worse to get in the fight, to argue or yell or insult the Buddha or that sort of thing. As some, there's some stories of monks who did that. It's far worse than going around criticizing a teacher who is less... Uh, impressive yeah. I think there's some I mean I don't know that that's exactly what it's saying what the Buddha is saying but there's that as well where to do wrong towards Buddhism is worse than doing wrong towards another teaching well sometimes I think um, people don't really understand the teaching and um, they do or say um, things that are not correct. And I don't say anything to that. Is that all right? That I'm not constantly correcting them? Well, to some extent, you should be correcting people when they tell you things that are wrong about the Buddhist teaching. Uh, actually, they are not telling me. Uh, let's say I see a post on Facebook that they are telling the world or something about some, um, about Buddhism that's not correct. Yeah, well, your first know. mistake was going on Facebook. Okay. Well, if you're active in a certain community and uh, you you are in the practice of uh, discussing the Dhamma, absolutely, you can correct somebody. Yeah, 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 I think, I mean, within reason, if someone on the internet, like on, on Reddit, there's been play times where someone would say something about me or our, our tradition that was just clearly yeah. wrong. There was one case not so long ago where someone said uh, that I had attacked a monk or some, and it was just ridiculous claims. And I said, that's not at all what I had said. And that this monk had claimed something that was against the Buddhist teaching, and I was just saying that that's against the Buddhist teaching. Anyway, it, it, so I think there's room for that, but within reason, I don't think you should make a rule that any time you see something wrong on the internet, you have to go and it's your duty to go and, and fix that. So within reason, I mean, let alone go and look for uh, things that someone might have said wrong. Yeah, it's just um, like the first mistake is Facebook, right? It's just there are so many uh, groups, uh, Buddhist, even Theravada or Mahasi um, groups. Yeah. And and uh, sometimes I'm just like really, I don't know what I'm, what am I doing here basically when, when I see the post. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things the Buddha said, I think, is uh, when, when you know the person will listen, or when you think the person will listen. Oh. So you, the part of the judging whether it's reasonable is whether it seems like the person will listen, the audience will appreciate it. I I did want to go back to the being so social or so socializing i think or i experience it um like sometimes um so there are periods where um there is a uh, maybe let's say desire towards it but um there are also like lo longer or shorter periods where where it's uh, there that disenchantment and that aloofness of uh, even if I have to participate, it's uh, 
you're not really in it or enjoying any of it or something. So I'm, I'm just asking, like, um, I think that's, uh, that's like normal. Or that's, uh, that's how it goes, right? Like, um, that's back and forth, basically. Well, the, yeah, I guess there's two back and forths. I mean, one back and forth is the desire and the aversion. So you can actually be angry when people are too engaging, like when your parents are bugging you, nagging, and so on. But friends and, and spouses and that sort of thing can be the same. So there's that back and forth. And then there's the back and forth of the clinging and the not clinging. So there can be times where you're clinging and times where you're not. Yeah, so the former is uh, right in the beginning, right? Like, uh, I, I feel like I'm in the second group where... Well, where the, yeah, the other, thing I, the other thing I was going to say is that in, in Buddhist practice, you can fall from, well, the second to, to the first in the sense that the... Uh, the, the the awareness or the experience of something as being not enjoyable in the way it used to be can trigger aversion even in meditators. So a meditator might start to get annoyed at people for for being happy and joyous around them or, or frivolous and uh, engaging in uselessness can, can get upset about it, right? This happens. And the same can go for, well, just about anything. Oh, I was thinking like with, with work, for example, people who meditate often complain about losing their ambition in work and feeling just drained by work. But you have to be able to separate the, the dispassion from the aversion. And so it's true that Meditation makes you more dispassionate about things that you used to be passionate about, but it's not the meditation that's making you averse to them. That's still on you, and you have to. That's why understanding the difference here is important. The difference between desire versus aversion and attachment versus uh, independence or non-attachment. Yeah. I I just want to mention that uh, maybe when people keep talking on their belief in God or something, I think I still have like a limit I can listen to and then I just, I'm off. Yeah, I mean, even that me. doesn't, isn't necessarily unwholesome. There is a point where you uh, stop listening or the correct response, the inclination is just to find something better to do or so on. Or, but exactly. that's, you know, it's, it's just about mindfulness. It's not, it's like when the Buddha says here, if you're inclined to walk, you're inclined to stand. If you're inclined to walk away, there's no problem with walking away. The problem is the the, the reactions. It's on a different level. It's how you're, how you're feeling at the time. Are you angry and irritated and annoyed at these people, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have just a question about solitude. Is there any danger in solitude? I mean, uh, sort of going from the note one one five seven, which talks about <clears throat> danger in solitude when one does not fulfill the proper purpose of solitary living. But solitude on its own, let's say, without giving into you know all the that society stuff that that was in the in the text. If one were to just be in solitude, is there any danger, or is it just beneficial? regardless of whether they are meditating on. Well, I guess the best is to say it's not enough. So it's very helpful, but solitude alone is lacking important, important factors. So go off alone with a bad frame of mind, then well, badness arises. Can go off alone in a good frame of mind or with good instruction. That's maybe the pair that you need. You need solitude and good direction. Those two together are 
generally sufficient. I mean, the other problem with seclusion, uh, like technical seclusion, would be, well, the inability to get instruction. So seclusion is usually tempered by having a relationship with the teacher. So you're not completely secluded. You're just secluded from everybody but your teacher. Like if you read about the five first five disciples of the Buddha, the, the Panchavagya, the commentary explains how uh, after the Buddha taught the first discourse, then uh, the Buddha and Kondanya went out for alms and the other four monks stayed behind. Kondanya had become a sotapanna, so he was less in need of uh, intensive seclusion. They stayed in seclusion, and then when they came back, the Buddha would instruct each of them individually every day, every day for five days. So one, one danger in solitude is that uh, there are two factors keeping you from doing bad things, uh, shame and fear, fear and shame of wrongdoings. So if you are not around people, you don't feel shame, ashamed to do wrong things because there's nobody seeing your activities. Uh, so that can be a problem. If you, like Mata said, if you go with the wrong mindset, nobody to correct yeah. you. To yeah, another you. useful thing that's, I mean, it's not necessary, but a useful thing is having examples. So being around others who are med who are also meditating. But that really doesn't interfere with your seclusion. It, if anything, it protects it. Well, the, the best part of a, a good community is that everyone leaves everyone else alone. So the, the, the community actually increases the seclusion because people don't, don't incline to talk with you. Whenever you see someone and you think, oh, I'm going to go talk with them, they look at you and they turn away and they go back to their meditation. So they protect your solitude because of the good example that they set. A bad community is where people look at each other and say, hey, let's sit around and talk instead of meditate. I tell the meditators they shouldn't even know each other's name before they leave. Even though you're staying in the same building or meditating in the same building and you see each other every day, every day. A good test is if you don't even know each other's names before you leave. Then you are really in solitude. But shouldn't we associate with good people like uh, if if you don't the only have person friends you need to with... associate with is your teacher that's how the buddha said it associate with the good friend who is the te the giver of meditation and yes associate with these people who ignore you who who shun you who tell you to go back and meditate and stop talking to me associate with those people the whole point Abante, i have a question so if um if someone from a different tradition asks us what do we refer to when we talk about voidness um is this a good example in the sutta that we can use just to kind of give them an idea of what we mean by that because sometimes sometimes they'll ask you know what 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 do you refer to when you say emptiness and it'll be different from say mahayana or something like that right no i don't think this is the best um description of emptiness he doesn't describe it so well so clearly here I mean, emptiness i think in the last sutta there was a bit of a better explanation of one type of emptiness um so emptiness we were talking about this last week emptiness can be the emptiness of proliferation the simplicity of of things and I think the last sutta did a better job, or, or maybe not a better job, but it was more descriptive about, more indicative of, of what the Buddha was talking about with void, with sunyata here. But sunyata is, um, in, in the technical texts, it's used to describe non-self, so the fact that, like, rupang sunyang, that's... The difference is in, in Mahayana, there's this text, Rupang Sunyatang. So Rupa is emptiness, which, anyway, it, it's not our teaching. Our teaching is Rupang Sunyang. Rupa is empty. So form is, is empty, I mean, empty of self. 
that has no uh, substance. It's ephemeral. It's like a bubble, like a mirage. Thank you, Bhante. What is the difference between a sunyata and anata, anata like the third sign, uh, anicca, dukkha, anata? Well, as I just said, that's usually what it refers to. Uh, it's the same. They are synonyms. They're not synonyms, but uh, sunyata is used to describe the emptiness or the absence of self. And anata? Anatta, like the sign, does the same. Anatta just literally means non, non self or not self. Ante, why is it not uh, translated as non soul? Or is it something else? Well, the word atta means self. That's why it's translated as non self. Atta hi atta no nat ho. The self is the refuge of oneself. Or oneself is one's own refuge, a better way of putting it. I mean, what, that quote serves to illustrate that the word isn't anything special. It's just a word refer, used to refer to oneself. Oneself is one's own refuge. It doesn't mean your soul is your refuge. And Pante, I have a question about, about Aditana, about determination. And um, how, what, what are ways uh, we can cultivate that? You make determination and making a determination repeatedly and reaffirm your determination, like making a, a vow or that sort of thing, and keeping to it, making a vow and keeping to it, and getting better at keeping your vows. Would it be beneficial to make a determination before setting, uh, before starting the timer, or is it uh, enough to just start it? Like, it could be. I mean, it might be a bit of overkill. We don't normally recommend making determination. I mean, determination is not the, the focus, right? The focus is mindfulness. So if you get too obsessed with making determinations, you're losing sight of what's most important. And it can get you on the wrong path. If you think that determination is the focus and it's going to be enough, then you start cultivating wrong view and ignorance and de delusion thinking that your determinations are going to be able to replace mindfulness or that your determinations are going to let you control the outcome and that sort of thing. And it, it, I mean, it's, it gives the subtle sense of self-control, self, that can lead to problems. When you take the five precepts in front of a Buddha statue, that's determination to making a vow not to break it. That's a good example. Yes, and thank you for pointing out to not get too obsessed with that, Pante. Yes, I have a question about uh, paragraph 14 and 15 about uh, the form cognizable by the senses. Um, sometimes I, outside of meditation uh, or formal, I am aware of the object and I understand that I like it and I desire it. The fact that I am I become aware of it is um, lesser the desire for the object. So at that point, I'm not sure what to do. If um, I still stay with the object or I withdraw from it, because withdrawing from it, uh, it seems that is already a version. You know, because in this passage it says um, um, in this way at the end of the passage say. Desire lasts for the five chords of sensual pleasure are, are abandoned in me. In this way is full awareness of that. So I was thinking that maybe, you know, like the, the awareness is already enough. If you can, please uh, explain to me, Bante. Well, it's, it's not enough, but it's the right path. So over time, it becomes enough. It becomes enough to abandon the desire. And it's like it's, it's um, it come spontaneously because it's not happen every time. But you know, there's this this these moments where oh, you know, like I have an object in front of me, and uh, oh, you know, like I I understand I am a, I am a, I f I feel that I want it that I like it. 
And yeah, well, I mean, over time, you lose the sense of I want, and there's just an awareness of the wanting arising and ceasing. It's It becomes oh. more subtle, and it, it evolves. And as it evolves, there's greater clarity and renunciation. Mm. Yeah, the high part, uh, it is also very important to understand that it does not exist. Thank you very much, Bante. I have a meditation question. If one wants to do standing meditation, is that more like sitting meditation, mean, meaning the person closes the eyes and focuses on respiration and goes through the points, or how yes. is that? Okay, thank you, Bante. Yeah, I, I was witness to a visiting monk who was given standing meditation by one of the teachers at our monastery. And the monk, the teacher apparently said, oh, you're the first monk I've ever given standing meditation to, but this monk had done a lot of samatha practice in the past. And I'm not saying, I, I don't, it's, it wouldn't have come to me exactly like that, but I can appreciate where this teacher was coming from. Uh, and I mean that was his. That was clearly the reason this monk had done some powerful meditations that um, could potentially lead to some complacency and some uh, subtle misperception of control and self and so on. So to shake them up a little bit would be helpful. So he had him do standing, which was unfamiliar. If he had him do sitting, it w I mean this is my guess. I, I again this isn't my thought process, but I assume the thought process was. If I have him do sitting, he's going to lapse back into his old habits, and so we'll give him walking meditation and or standing meditation instead. And because it's unfamiliar, it will uh, help him to begin to practice this, this new way. It makes sense in my mind. I've never done such a thing, but yeah, I remember that happening, and I assume it had good results. Do you? Individuals who already develop, say, first or second jhana, do better in our tradition as well, where it varies. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think it would hurt for sure. It, it, there's different factors. Um, it's not the jhanas themselves at all, but sometimes there's um, there's things that the jhana can can suppress and. It make those things make it hard, like attachments, views, that sort of thing that that are not destroyed or eradicated or removed, and can often be, well, in, in some cases, kind of cultivated through the obsession with samatha practice. And as a result, when people come to vipassana, it's hard for them. Like there's even non-Buddhist meditators who believe in God, and then it's just really impossible for them to let go of that through our practice and it's complicated because of the jhana because they will lapse back into that and think that that's the right practice so for those people it's not the jhanas but these views can be really hard to you have to really go slow with them and it takes them a lot longer in fact it can take a lot longer than an ordinary person not because of the jhanas again but because of their views about the jhana they're about it, they're clinging to it, that sort of thing, and, and clinging to all sorts of other things. That the jhana somehow protects because they, they're not challenged. They cannot they have a stability of mind, strength of mind that allows them to hold these wrong views. For for someone who doesn't have the jhanas, it's much harder. You're anytime you have any kind of uh, unwholesomeness, it's pretty unpleasant. But uh, you can just enter into the jhana and the unwholesomeness is gone and you don't have to you're not confronted. You don't have to confront your bad habits, your your bad side. Not in the same way. I've been uh, faced with sometimes like questions from people who did quite a long for a long longer time or periods uh, like yoga, meditations, whatever those are. But they do have this view on the sometimes the chakras and energy and stuff like that. So 
Um, so it's, it, not the, it's not the jhanas. The jhanas aren't going to get in the way. They'll, they should help. And for some people, they really do help. But it's all the other stuff around it that is, can be really it's a few. problematic. Views, uh, yeah. Yeah, basically or, views, but views in, in, in two ways. Like a view is in a belief, but a view is also in the perspective, the way they look at it, mm -hmm. their outlook, their determination, their goals, those sorts of things. Because Their that's the hard part, right? Like when, when they, whatever you're saying, they are interpreting it as, as this chakra or that energy or that, what, what not. Right. So and, it's not a blocker. It's just it, it makes it take longer and it's slower for them to realize the, yeah, wrong views can, can be blockers, but usually just. You just have to slow. Even Buddhists, like there's a great story Lumpo Chodok t tells about a very famous monk who is one of the most famous meditation teachers in Thailand, so much so that he came to practice meditation at uh, Wat Mahathat with the queen, the, 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 the mother of the king. They came together at the same time. Uh, so he was like one of the, like a royal meditation teacher. But they both came to practice uh, Satipatthana Vipassana. Lumpo Chodok tells about his stories of teaching, teaching him, and uh, he had to be. He would see these, these uh, crystal. He would see this crystal, which was what he was famous for for having people visualize a crystal. And he said, "Yeah, I see this, the the crystal." And and Lumpo Chodok said, yeah. "Oh, very good, very good." Like he would have to be very. Uh, kind of go along with it. So he said, oh, very, very good, very good, very good. Just say seeing, seeing. And that's perfect, you know. You tell them how good it is and then tell them to just just disregard, disregard like disregard it as important, like make it banal in the same sentence. Oh, very, very good. Just say seeing, seeing. And uh, he did that for a couple of days. And like on the third day, this, this story is really good because the way he tells it, it's just the perfect example uh, he says, and then on the third day, he came back to me, and he was just devastated in a way that it doesn't sound like he should be devastated, because it just disappeared. He was saying, seeing, seeing, and suddenly the, the crystal just disappeared, and he couldn't get it back. This is the first, his first taste of impermanent suffering and non-self. And it really, uh, and, and he wrote a letter that's still, or when I was there, it was still up in Wat Mahathat saying that this practice at section five of Wat Mahathat is the true teachings of the Buddha. Like he was really impressed by, by what he gained from it. Which is why I, I had people, I, I encouraged people to watch, or I, I had good things to say about this movie, Angulimala, the, the Thai version of the Angulimala movie, just for that scene alone, where the Buddha shows him exactly the same way as it with, with this very famous monk, uh, that, that this, this crystal that he, he was visualizing is impermanent suffering and non-self. I was so surprised that this movie had, had exactly what we teach and was a pretty good representation of what would happen if someone who practiced samatha uh, comes to practice vipassana. Yeah, it's just not the regular samatha that, um, you know, uh, we are represented with, within the suttas or even Abhidhamma like describe the four subjects or something and then you know what to say. These are like our new concepts. Um, that's well, it comes down to thinking, tell people thinking. As long as mm -hmm. they're noting thinking, I mean, you can just ignore people's views for the most part. Mm -hmm. Like, like that's basically what Lumpo Chodok did, you know. Oh, yeah. very, very good. Just coddle, coddle him first and then say, yeah, just say seeing, seeing. Yeah. I wonder what he did when uh, this monk was panicked and uh, because it, it went away. Well, he so... would have explained to him that now this is now you're seeing him, the three characteristics. Yeah. That's important to remind meditators when they're seeing, when they're, uh, freaking out, you can remind them that this is three characteristics. Yeah, that they actually are succeeding, not failing. Yeah, they're they're 
seeing something that makes them uncomfortable. Uh, but that's a sign that they're they they're lacking in familiarity with reality, which is the whole point of practicing. Once it's familiar to you, it no longer disturbs you or makes you react or makes you try and chase it away or fix it or that sort of thing. Um, but uh, we Handu has a question in the chat. I'll uh, read it for the recording. When noting the postures of the body, like standing, sitting, I am unsure of where my mind should be, what object it should be focused on. <clears throat> Currently, I focus on my legs when I note sitting and focus on the bottom of my feet when noting standing. Is this way of noting correct? Well, noting happens after the experience. so. When you experience your body standing, you know, standing. I mean, standing is really just conceptual. So it's just a remarking of the nature of the experience. There's no specific spot that's going to be telling you you're standing. Like your legs are not standing, your body is standing. Your legs are not sitting, your body is sitting. So it's not about one spot. It's just about... Uh, uh, awareness of whatever posture you're disposed in, and then a reminder that it is what it is. The point being to uh, to both focus your attention on that experience or keep you focused on that experience, and also to have clarity and simplicity in the mind so that the mind isn't extrapolating on it or making more out of it that's you know, reacting to it it's just a habit i mean it's just the, the body is this good object to develop this habit or this skill or this perspective this mindset of just telling it like it is there's nothing magical or you know, there's no secret or special way of doing it that's going to be better if you focus here or focus there are you standing now okay then say standing are you sitting? And say sitting. Bante, I have a question. Um, is Limpo Chodok's teachings available on the internet? I think so. Uh, there's so many of them. It's probably one of the most prolific, apart from Mahasi Sayada in our tradition. But they're all in Thai. Is he still alive? No, he died in the 80s, I think, or late 80s, early 90s. We, we have uh, his picture, right, in the middle? Uh, well, we have his picture here. Oh, yeah, you're here. <laughs> yes, we have his picture. Yeah, I think... Uh, how do you have his picture? Oh, right, you're next door. Has no one tried to do translations for his teachings? I think there's at least one small booklet... Uh, on the internet, what was uh, the Lauer? Remember that booklet that you guys found? I think that's from Limpo Chodo. The Lauer here, yeah. Which one, Bunting? Remember when Inside? we were doing, uh, we were doing, and Parta came up and said, "Oh, it's all on the internet." Oh, I said, yeah. "This book, this book, you don't just give out. Nobody should. Nobody, you don't just give this out." And Parta said, "Oh, it's all on the internet." Yes, in okay. English. No, I mean that 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 is not the best. Uh, I mean that's not that's not the actual teachings of Lumpo Chodok. All of his teachings, the talks he gave, like he would give lecture after lecture after lecture. Those are really good to listen to, but they're all in Thai still. I mean, they don't beat Mahasi Sayadaw's stuff. So just read what Mahasi Sayadaw wrote. There's no nothing better. I mean, besides the Buddhist teaching, but Mahasi Sayadaw is, is uh, I mean, it's just so directed to what we do. In some ways, it might be more fruitful than reading the Buddhist teaching, especially for a beginner, because it's directed and directed to people who have a harder time than the Buddhist students. The Buddhist students often didn't have such a hard time and so didn't need as much instruction or 
Conversely, the people who did, that instruction didn't get recorded down, potentially. Because, you know, how are you going to record all the detailed instructions? So they record the more general stuff, because there's still so much of that already. And they, they talked in their native language. I think that's a big factor, too, which we are missing. We don't know Pali or... Uh, Something like that. Well, Mahasi Syed also, tra also taught in Burmese, which is nothing like English. Oh. So it's also problematic. But he had good translators. I really, the, the, his translators were often strong meditators as well, which helped. So not only did they do good, I mean, some of their translations are not perfect, but the point, the meaning is, is good because they understand the, the meaning behind it in a way that a scholar wouldn't. Like there was one Mahasi book that's translated by a Westerner and they added something in that wasn't there. And it was important because it's one of these questions people often ask and I just stop noting. It's sort of a perennial question I, I used to get anyway. And uh, this book says after a while the noting, the noting fades away and there's just the experience. And uh, I read the Hi. How did this go? I don't remember now. But anyway, there's this whole search. Uh, at first, I thought, oh, well, that's a strange thing to say. And I just assumed it was, but I was wrestling with it. I said, because, you know, that's, that's not what my teacher says. And it doesn't seem right. Uh, but here it is in a book by Mahasi Sayada. And at one point, somehow, I got a hold of a Thai translation of the same text that was missing that sentence in Thai. Oh, no. That instead said the right thing, that after some time, which makes perfect sense, after some time, the concept disappears, and all that's left is the ultimate reality. Uh, it's regarding this standing, sitting, because Mahasi Sayada addresses this, where people were saying, well, well how can you note things like standing or sitting, aren't those just conceptual? And he said, it, it's fine to have notings be conceptual because they're based on the experience. And after a while, the conceptual disappears and all that's left is the ultimate reality. That's what, what Mahasi Sayada said. And this person translated it really poorly, saying after a while, the noting disappears and all that's left is the experience or something like that. So that sort of thing is important. That's really un unfortunate. There was another, there's another group, I think it's the same topic. There's another group in Bangkok that insists that the noting can be dropped or is not necessary. And so I was reading a book. I said, oh, here's Mahasi Sayadaw Thai. It's, it's purported to be a book uh, by Mahasi Sayadaw on meditation. And I started reading it and I was happily reading it. And then at one point it says this, something about, noting it may have even been this exact passage and there's a footnote oh no there's not even a footnote it's part of the text where it starts describing how the noting was something uh pushed by lumpo chodok and i realized this isn't actually written by mahasi Sayada. this is written by somebody else claiming to be because lumpo chodok was was teaching well after mahasi Sayada. This was by the people who were who were spreading this book, and they were adding their own interpretation, saying that uh, the noting is some Thai invention or something like that. Anyway, a bit of a tangent, but all right. Well, have a good week, everyone. Sadhu. Sadhu.